I'm glad to be here this morning and to uh, meet a bunch of new friends uh, and uh, listen to some very interesting uh, papers. Uh, and I'm only disappointed that my European friends don't get my last name right. Uh, it's Guth. Uh, and I'm in Europe. Nobody ever messes that up. So I don't know what happened to you folks, but uh, uh, in any case, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and I'm going to try to avoid making a mess of like I do in my classes and uh, share the screen right away here if I can uh, and uh, bring up a well what's going on here all right uh, okay um I've been interested in the American uh, populism for quite a quite a while now, and also been doing work on European populism and the connection of religion uh, to populism in both uh, uh, contexts. Uh, and uh, this project got started uh, back a few years ago when uh, a group at Calvin College uh, got a grant to study the relationship between evangelicalism, American evangelicalism, uh, and populism. Uh, and uh, they did a very thorough study, both of uh, political elites, and uh, my job was to kind of look at the mass public uh, in the United States and see how uh, religion, and especially uh, evangelical affiliation, evangelical uh, beliefs, influenced adherence uh, to uh, populism. Uh, unfortunately, the answers that I found uh, were not the answers that many of the academic sponsors of the project hoped to uh, get. Uh, I discovered that in one way or another, in, in 2016 at least, uh, the evangelical community was very much uh, uh, adherence of populist ideology in a whole variety of different dimensions, uh, and uh, that this really kind of helped explain why uh, they were willing to vote for a candidate uh, who was so far different uh, from them, both religiously uh, and morally. Uh, and uh, this uh, was, of course, uh, something that uh, uh, was not unexpected by me, but uh, came as a surprise uh, to at least some of the sponsors of the, uh, of the research. Uh, my interest was a little bit broader than that. Uh, I was interested not only in the way evangelicals reacted to populist uh, ideology, uh, but to how other religious groups did as well, and also to try to uh, identify the various aspects of religion, uh, the what we sometimes call the three Bs, belonging, behavior, and beliefs, uh, which of these were most powerful in influencing the response of religious people to, uh, uh, to, have an, uh, to uh, populism. Um, and so um, uh, I want to start by uh, looking at our general research question, what role does religion play in the rise of American right-wing populism? I'm not going to look at uh, left wing populism, uh, because right wing populism is what we deal with here, primarily in the United States. Uh, and of course, they're looking at the background of uh, uh, theories of populism. Uh, they're basically three different approaches. Uh, one, which finds populism arising primarily from various kinds of economic stress, globalization, uh, the dislocations uh, of uh, traditional communities, uh, economic communities, uh, populism is an expression of economic discontent. Um, this uh, is a approach that dominates most journalistic treatments of uh, populism uh, and some scholarly work as well. Uh, but most of the uh, scholarly work on European and American populism has tended to uh, take the form of cultural theories, which see populism, especially right-wing populism, uh, as a result of some kind of cultural resentment, especially against immigrants, minorities, or uh, cultural elites, uh, or as kind of a reassertion of traditional identity, uh, national identity, if you will. There are some scholars who try uh, to combine them. Danny Rad Roderick, who's a famous uh, uh, economist uh, at Harvard, uh, has uh, put together a kind of uh, combined theory uh, which sees cultural uh, expression uh, resulting from economic dislocations. Uh, and so he uh, puts these two approaches uh, uh, together. Uh, in any case, in most of uh, these theories, uh, religion uh, does make a kind of cameo appearance. It does appear uh, in one way or another, uh, but it's very seldom taken uh, very seriously as an important independent uh, influence. And uh, if you want to have just a quick a brief treatment of uh, uh, some kind of underlying 
perspectives. You have a kind of Marxian answer that uh, you know religion is the opiate of the oppressed or the proletariat or the economically distressed. Uh, and that therefore, uh, when you see any kind of religious connections to modern uh, populism, it's purely epiphenomenal. Uh, it's not causal. It's just kind of a marker of distress. Uh, and indeed, some American theorists argue that uh, religion is used by elites to create a kind of false consciousness uh, to divert attention away from real economic uh, woes. Um, uh, the Economist magazine uh, has a little bit different approach. Most of its articles tend to see uh, religious belief and behavior is there in populism, uh, but it's primarily because they are correlated with uh, the people who are really hurt by the globalized economy, the blue collar workers, less educated uh, citizens, rural people, uh, folks like that, but uh, they don't really see any kind of causal uh, influence on the choice of populist uh, candidates and parties and political uh, styles. Um, a lot of European scholars have noted that uh, right-wing populist groups have uh, recently uh, begun to use uh, religious symbols uh, as uh, an assertion of kind of national identity, especially in opposition to Muslims or other religious minorities, uh, but without much attachment to traditional religious belief or behavior. And some of the work that I've done with my colleague Brent Nelson uh, confirms that at least in terms of voting, uh, right-wing populist governments, uh, except perhaps in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, populist voters uh, tend to actually be less religious uh, than certainly groups like Christian Democratic voters. Uh, and uh, so not an active force in that sense. Um, others see a certain a connection. Uh, religion is, of course, long associated with traditional values. We've had a lot of discussion about that already. Uh, and right-wing populists, uh, at least in many contexts, often give expression to what uh, uh, Norris and Engelhart would call uh, materialist ideology, as opposed to post-materialist ideology, uh, which includes these things like feminism and gay rights and concern for civil liberties and all of those kinds of good things. Um, and finally, uh, American scholarship focuses on uh, cultural resentment, as we've noted a little bit earlier, uh, especially in uh, opposition to outgroups, immigrants, Muslims, African Americans, Asian Americans, uh, to name just a few. Uh, sometimes uh, this is seen by American scholars as white identity, sometimes it's uh, Christian nationalism, uh, sometimes white Christian nationalism. Uh, all of these are often uh, tending to get at pretty much uh, the same thing. And we're going to incorporate a lot of these uh, in our analysis uh, with empirical, uh, uh, empirical measures. But first, we have to define what we, what white ring populism is, in the, certainly in the American context and probably elsewhere as well. Um, and these are uh, concepts that uh, are really kind of uh, derived both from theory uh, and from empirical analysis. And so I put these together. If you're interested, I'll be glad to send you the paper with a lot more details on uh, how these were derived. Uh, but um, there's a rough consensus among many scholars of populism that populism is a thin ideology. Uh, and it has more to do with perceptions about the nature of the political system than it does with any kind of ideological content. Um, and uh, that's one aspect of our analysis. Uh, one of the dimensions of populism that we're looking at is what I call majoritarian rough politics. Um, and this is basically uh, an argument in favor of majoritarian popular sovereignty. Uh, you know, majorities ought to rule, minorities ought to submit, uh, this kind of majoritarian rule is usually through a charismatic leader who embodies the real people uh, in a society uh, and often uses what I've called a rough political style, a uh, little concern for civil liberties, uh, willingness to uh, engage in harsh political discourse, uh, all the kinds of things that we sometimes think of as characteristic of Donald Trump's uh, political, uh, political style, but characteristic of populists the world over. Um, there are three other dimensions that are often uh, put in this kind of thin ideology category of uh, distrust of politicians. Populists uh, don't trust political elites. Uh, they also see their society uh, because of the betrayal by political elites as being in a state of decline. Uh, the good old days are disappearing. Uh, there's a, a sense that both the country and its citizens have seen a better uh, 
uh, better days. Uh, and another important element is distrust of experts. Uh, populist ideology generally uh, wants uh, to uh, put a good bit of emphasis on the good sense of citizens and reject scientific uh, findings, uh, uh, journalistic uh, analysis, uh, bureaucratic expertise. And so uh, those are three other thin uh, dimensions of populist attitudes. But as many scholars have pointed out, uh, these traits, thin traits, always get in by, uh, in combined with thicker ideological themes that are directly related to public policy. Uh, those are different on the left and right. In the case of right-wing populists, these include uh, a reassertion of national identity. Uh, in most societies, that includes uh, rejections of limits to national sovereignty that are posed by multinational commitments. Uh, in Europe, populists generally don't like the European Union. In the United States, uh, we don't like the European Union, but we don't like uh, uh, all of the other international organizations to which uh, previous uh, American administrations have committed, our, uh, committed us to. Um, national identity politics usually valorizes traditional majority ethnic culture and norms, and sometimes that gets historic religious traditions uh, in. Uh, that's often seen in anti-immigrant sentiments, nativism, preference for white political power, uh, certainly anti-Muslim sentiment, both in Europe and, and America. Uh, in the American case, State of Scotch Bowl, for example, sees ethno-nationalism and Christian conservatism as the twin pillars of Trump's populism. Uh, Whitehead and Perry combine this into Christian nationalism. So we're going to have the, a big, broad combination of these factors that we're going to simply refer to uh, as white Christian nationalism. Um, social traditionalism, which we've already mentioned, uh, and this takes the form of moral traditionalism, sexual chauvinism, anti-feminism, uh, or emphasis on law and order. Uh, Ronald Englehart famously has uh, argued that uh, uh, populists reject uh, post-materialist values in favor of materialist ones, or uh, Hooge and Marx use uh, uh, green alter alter alternative libertarian values are uh, uh, opposed by populists uh, uh, who favor traditional authoritarian ones. Lots of different terminology, uh, but it's clear that conservative populists are uncomfortable with new moral uh, frameworks uh, and their advocates. And this is uh, true um, as scholars have discovered both uh, in Europe and in America. So we're going to look at social traditionalism as one other dimension of populism. And finally, uh, we're going to incorporate welfare chauvinism. Uh, many of you are familiar with this. This is a concept European scholars use a good bit um, and has, be, has become a major element uh, in the agenda of populist uh, radical right types. Uh, welfare chauvinists want public benefits confined to worthy members of society. That usually means hardworking native citizens, um, not unworthy immigrants, aliens, and minority groups. Uh, as many scholars have noted, uh, these attitudes tend to fester uh, when economic and cultural diversities increase in a particular society. Uh, and in contexts like the American case, they often become uh, racialized. Um, American analysts don't usually use this idea, but they've often uh, described a, a similar phenomenon. So these are the dimensions of populism that we're going to be looking at. Um, and um, in order to do so and to get a, a, a purchase on the way American religion influences the response to populism by different religious groups, uh, we're going to use two different broad theoretical perspectives uh, on American religion. Uh, and we kind of introduced all of these, uh, both of these uh, in our earlier discussions. Uh, one of these is what we call ethno-cultural or ethno-religious theory. Um, this is a theory that uh, has been given a lot of attention by American political historians. It argues that American politics has always been defined uh, by competing ethno-religious groups that have constituted the building blocks of, a, of American party coalitions. Uh, and to make a long story short, uh, the older British and Western European Protestant traditions have usually been at the core of the Republican and conservative side of the political spectrum and ethno-religious minorities, whether Catholics, Jews, Black Protestants, or now Muslims, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, have always preferred the Democrats. 
Uh, and although these kinds of ethno-religious coalitions have changed over time, uh, journalists and scholars today still often refer to Jewish vote or the Latino Catholic vote or the evangelical uh, vote. Um, and so we're going to look at how the combination of ethnicity and religion, which is hard to separate in many uh, cases, uh, whether those divisions still define the response to uh, populism or not. Another theory, which has also been introduced by uh, many of the previous presenters, is what uh, is known in the sociology of religion as restructuring theory, uh, sometimes popularly known as culture war theories. Um, and this is uh, primarily made famous by the work of Robert Withnow uh, and James Davis and Hunter, uh, who argue that the old ethno-religious traditions uh, are not as relevant uh, anymore as they once were uh, to American politics. So today we have uh, the theological lines between uh, people who are orthodox or conservative or traditionalist on one side uh, and religious progressives or liberals or modernists, whatever the term you want to use on the other side. And it's really these new theological formations that shape religious politics. Uh, thus, the orthodox, if you will, from all traditions uh, tend to vote for the Republicans, and the progressives from all traditions uh, tend to vote for the Democrats. Uh, and the inroads of secularization uh, have added an increasing number of the nuns or the unaffiliated to the Democratic side, especially if they claim a secular or secularist uh, identity. Uh, and here I'd um, refer you to the very fine recent work of uh, David Campbell, Jeff Lehman, and J John Green, uh, three of my longtime contributors uh, who, uh, uh, who have uh, written a very fine book on uh, secular identity uh, that just came out this, uh, this uh, spring, I think. Um, as we're going to see, both the ethnocultural and restructuring perspectives help provide some insight into the religious location uh, of right-wing populist attitudes. Um, Let's get to the, uh, the actual study itself. Uh, we're going to be using the 2020 American National Election Study. Uh, some of you know that this is the Senate sort of gold standard for American electoral studies, uh, and it's, uh, it has very useful attributes for us. Uh, we're basically replicating the work that we did in 2016 um, and asking a very important question. What has changed uh, in this sort of populist framework uh, over the four years of the populist Trump administration. We might expect that uh, we might have some differences in the way religious groups have responded uh, to the themes of conservative populism uh, because of uh, the experience of those four years. Um, the ANES has a very wide range of measures uh, for tapping populist traits, uh, allowing those traits that I talked about above to be measured by a very broad multi-item score. So, uh, I, I won't be able to go into depth, uh, but almost all of these uh, scores uh, that measure these traits uh, are made up of uh, 10 or 12 or even uh, 20 different variables that are very highly correlated with each other uh, that provide a very broad and very strong uh, measure of that particular trait or, or uh, variable, if you will. Um, the ANES also has good religious measures uh, to allow us to test uh, both the ethnocultural and restructuring uh, approaches. Uh, it has good religious affiliation, religiosity, and religious belief measures, uh, which again are all measured by uh, multiple items. And so we're not depending upon just one item or two items uh, to tap any of these. Uh, any of these. I might have one caveat here. Uh, unfortunately, the version of the ANES that's out uh, right now does not de have detailed denominational measures for Protestants. Uh, that'll come out later. And so we're uh, using a couple of shortcuts uh, in order to uh, estimate who's evangelical Protestant and who's mainline Protestant. Uh, uh, but I think our results would be even stronger if we had a little bit measure, better measure of religious affiliation available. Those will come a little bit later and we'll do some revision uh, when that uh, takes, uh, takes place. Uh, we're going to have uh, some correlations here and some OLS regression, uh, and I'll explain those uh, for the humanist in our midst uh, as we go, go along. Um, here we have a, a, a table which simply looks at 
uh, the correlations between uh, religious variables and the dimensions of conservative populism. And I want you all to take a very careful look at each of these coefficients. And uh, um, seriously, I will explain exactly what's going on here. Uh, there's a lot of data here. Uh, but uh, what we are looking at is simply the relationship between each of these variables and the different dimensions uh, of, uh, of uh, populist attitudes. Um, and uh, we go across the top. These are the different dimensions. All of these are uh, very detailed measures, uh, which have lots of variables in them. Uh, majoritarian rough politics, distrust of government, distrust of experts, declinism, white Christian nationalism, uh, traditional uh, values. And I've got to see if I can move some of the people here. Uh, welfare chauvinism. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a very short summary of what this table uh, shows. Uh, on most of these measures, as we found in 2016, uh, there's a very clear division uh, between white evangelical Protestants who, are, uh, who score most strongly on most of the populist traits. So for example, uh, to take a typical illustration, a majority politics, you'll notice from the coefficients there uh, that white evangelical Protestants have a fairly strong coalition uh, with uh, this particular perspective. On the other hand, you'll note at the uh, other end of the scale, uh, agnostics and atheists are very negative. And so we have a range from white evangelical Protestants to agnostics and atheists. Most of the traditional white uh, religious traditions like white Catholics, Latter-day Saints, uh, those who are religious but have no particular religion, uh, tend to be on mildly on the populist side. Well, most of the religious minorities, as we might expect, uh, tend to fall on the negative side. So uh, the world religions category, by the way, is uh, Muslims, uh, Buddhists, uh, put them all together because they're not terribly numerous and uh, we wouldn't have nice stable coefficients if we did. Uh, but you can kind of see the pattern as you go down that column among the uh, various religious groups. Note that Latino evangelicals uh, are a little bit on the populist side, uh, and they're quite different than Latino Catholics who fall on the other side of the scale modestly. Uh, but the big story is, of course, in conservative theology. Uh, that those people who fall on the traditionalist side of that restructuring uh, are very strongly populist. Uh, those who are highly committed to religion and behavioral terms uh, are also uh, more likely to be uh, a populist. Uh, in part, those two things are very closely connected. Uh, people who have conservative theologies uh, do tend to uh, go to church more often and are more committed. And so those things are kind of uh, tied together. Uh, in terms of religious identifications, what people think of themselves as, uh, evangelical identification is associated with uh, populist, right-wing populist attitudes on majoritarian rough politics. Uh, progressive identification, progressive religious identification is uh, on the other side. As, our, as is secular identification. That pattern is the one we see on uh, the distrust of experts, uh, on white Christian nationalism, on traditional values, and on welfare chauvinism. What has changed in an interesting way uh, from 2016, in 2016, the pattern was the same all the way across the table. But in 2020, uh, the distrust government and declinism results have changed. Uh, in 2016, the same pattern that we see elsewhere uh, applied to distrust government. Uh, in 2020, the results are very, very weak. They're just not there very much. And on declinism, the sense that things are really going bad in the country, and really going bad for its people, has exactly reversed. Uh, so that evangelicals in 2020 felt much more positive about the country and about the fate of the uh, nation. 
And those who were conservative in theology uh, were also much more likely to feel that things were going better rather than worse. And those who were more religious and those who were evangelical were more likely to have a positive outlook. Uh, what this tells us, of course, uh, and it doesn't take uh, uh, any kind of social scientist to figure this out, is that people who responded to populism responded well to Donald Trump and thought that he was really making things better. Uh, and so declinism and maybe even distrust of government uh, may not be an inherent part of all right-wing populism. Uh, that's kind of situational factor, uh, and it depends on who's in power and how populists react to the person uh, in, in power. Well, that's a kind of uh, a broad overview of how uh, different religious groups respond to these different aspects of conservative populism. Now, since the patterns are very similar across here, uh, we might expect that this is all part of a much broader kind of syndrome that what we call the populist syndrome. Uh, and in fact, uh, when you do a statistical analysis of it, uh, this is called the principal components analysis, we find that all of these different dimensions really hang together very, very, very tightly. Uh, in other words, uh, if you're a white Christian nationalist on the Christian nationalism scale, you're also a social traditionalist. You also don't like un, uh, uh, un, uh, likely people getting welfare benefits. Uh, you are in favor of what we've called rough politics, majoritarian rough politics, and you don't like Anthony Fauci very much. You think he's not been telling the truth about uh, the uh, COVID uh, epidemic. Uh, but on the other hand, this time around, uh, you think on the whole, things are getting better in, in the country. Um, so what we did here was simply uh, calculate a score based on this analysis. Uh, and converted it to a zero to 100 scale uh, as a way of summarizing where the different groups fall uh, on the uh, populist syndrome. Uh, and here you see uh, re uh, the religious traditions in pretty much the order that we had them before. You'll note the big gap uh, between uh, the mean score for white evangelical Protestants uh, right up at the top of the scale at almost 72 and agnostics and atheists down there around 27. And to give you some sense of how it works with other religious variables, I've uh, put the mean scores in. If you're a biblical literalist, uh, you have a score of 66. If you believe the Bible is a bunch of myths and legends, uh, you're way down at 30, 33. If you go to church more often than once a week, uh, you're a pretty populist. If you never go to church, uh, you're kind of on the other end. If you think religion is very important, uh, you're much more to the populist side. If you think it's not at all important, you're on the other end. If you have an ideal uh, evangelical identification, uh, you're fairly populist. If you have a secular identification, uh, you're uh, quite anti-populist. So we can see religious groups uh, do divide uh, both in terms of ethno-religious tradition uh, and in terms of these restructuring questions of conservative versus liberal religion, however you want to define that. Uh, finally, our final bit of data analysis here uh, is looking at how uh, these religious factors uh, intermesh with other social and political uh, factors. Um, we've got the correlations there of our scale, uh, populism scale, right-wing populism scale, with all the religious variables down the first column. Um, and in the fir uh, first uh, model there, model one, all religious variables, uh, we've used a regression to predict uh, the populist syndrome on the basis of the various uh, ver religious variables. And uh, what we find is uh, not unexpected uh, that uh, conservative theology is by far the best predictor of adherence to populist, the populist syndrome, if you will. Uh, being an evangelical and an evangelical denomination adds a little bit to that. Uh, being a white Catholic or a Mormon adds a little more. Uh, mainline Protestants on, on balance tend to be a little more populist. Uh, and then we see uh, most of the other religious groups uh, kind of wash out. Black Protestants actually become more anti-populist once you take their conservative theology into account. 
And so that's a very helpful um, uh, finding. Uh, religious identifications uh, tend to uh, be greatly reduced because theology picks up all that influence, but there's still uh, some impact of being self-consciously uh, evangelical in religion or being progressive in religion or being uh, a self-conscious secular person. Um, this is interesting in part because it explains a good bit of the variation in populist attitudes. Down at the bottom, we have what we call the adjusted R square, uh, which tells us that about four tenths of all of the variation between individuals in uh, populist adherence is explained just by their religious characteristics. And that's pretty powerful as social science goes. Uh, in model two, we add in uh, the impact of uh, demographic variables. And here we pick the four things that are most often seen as powerful political influences. Uh, education uh, quite clearly has an impact. The more educated you are, the less populist you are. Uh, if you're female, you're less populist. Interestingly enough, income has absolutely no net effect. Uh, the coefficient is, is zero. Um, so once you take uh, you know, education, female, uh, gender, and uh, the various religious characteristics into account, uh, income completely washes out. And interestingly enough, uh, all these important demographic characteristics add very little to our explanation. Adds only 2% of the variance explained. And you'll notice the coefficients for the religious uh, variables uh, change hardly at all. That tells us that they're basically independent of all of these social demographic factors. Finally, we want to see where all this kind of fits into traditional political uh, variables that political scientists use all the time, like party identification, which we always find is the most powerful predictor of presidential votes, uh, and ideological identification. Uh, those two things, by the way, are in American politics now are so closely correlated, uh, to some extent, it doesn't make much sense even to put them in separately because uh, they split an awful lot of variance. Uh, but as you might expect, we explain a lot more of the populist syndrome. Republicans are populist, conservatives are populist. Uh, and you notice that uh, most of the ethno-religious traditions, uh, the coefficients uh, become insignificant. They're no longer there. Uh, and that tells us, of course, that in a lot of ways, our religious traditions are baked into partisanship. Uh, to say one is an evangelical Protestant is to say that one is a, pro is a, is a Republican. Uh, to be an agnostic and atheist is very likely uh, to mean that you're a Democrat. Um, and so the party identification absorbs uh, those coefficients. But note that uh, conservative theology still stay significant and fairly strong. In other words, it does add to our understanding of who adopts uh, these uh, populist attitudes, uh, as does uh, the progressive and secular identifications, which tells us a little bit about uh, who opposes it. And some of the demographics also continue to work uh, to, some, uh, to some extent. Uh, but uh, one of the interesting things here is that um, if you are going to predict the vote for Donald Trump uh, in 2020, political scientists traditionally would say, uh, well, uh, you put in party identification, that's going to be the most powerful predictor. And then you put in conservative ideology, and that's going to come in next. And any other kinds of residual influences of attitudes uh, probably won't have any effect at all. Um, if you do that here and you do what we call a stepwise regression and allow the one that variable explains the most variation to come into the equation first, it's the populist syndrome that comes in first. And this tells us that there's something to populism beyond simply partisanship and ideology. It hasn't been entirely captured in the American scene by uh, Republican Democratic identification or liberal conservative identification. Okay, um, what really matters here? Well, uh, the key dimensions of conservative pro populism exhibit a lot of continuity since 2016, but there are some changes. 
Uh, most of the things that constituted populism in 2016 are still present four years later. Majoritarian rough politics, disdain for expertise, white Christian nationalism, social traditionalism, and welfare chauvinism were, if anything, more tightly integrated into a ideology than they were in 2016. On the other hand, declinism had yielded to optimism about the national condition. Uh, both of these results probably reflect the impact of the Trump administration, which constantly emphasized the central populist themes on the one hand, but provided hope for the national future to its supporters on the other hand. Uh, similarly, the religious contributions to conservative populism uh, look very much the same as they did in 2016. Evangelicals are still the religious vanguard of right-wing populism. Agnostics, atheists, and secular citizens are the uh, uh, vanguard of the resistance, if you will. Uh, the older white mainline Protestant, Catholic, and LDS traditions provide some um, modest populist support, while ethno-religious minorities are on the other side. But within almost all uh, religious communities, and this is increasingly the so, uh, so uh, the uh, division between traditionalist or orthodox people and progressive or liberal or modernist people uh, increasingly defines uh, the response to populism. In other words, we see this restructuring division between religious conservatives and religious liberals uh, extending beyond uh, white Protestant and Catholic uh, environments into other religious traditions. So uh, you find, for example, that among Hispanic Catholics, uh, those who are more traditionalist were more likely to vote for Donald Trump and more likely to have populist attitudes. Still not a majority, uh, but uh, we see that kind of division beginning to take place in traditional ethno-religious uh, groups that uh, have previously been monolithically uh, uh, democratic in, in many, many respects. Um, as these tendencies uh, feed into the party system, uh, we understand why the Republicans have increasingly exhibited these populist tendencies, but especially in terms of style, what we call rough politics uh, element of uh, populism. And this isn't necessarily captured by uh, just partisanship uh, and ideology. Um, so looking at this data, I'd have to say that uh, we're looking here at the uh, way in which uh, various kind of long-term divisions, which in, in the American public have been evoked and activated uh, and made uh, salient in the American political process. And I think all of this suggests that right-wing populism uh, is going to remain a powerful force uh, for at least the foreseeable future. Uh, in American American political life. Uh, thank you, and I hope I didn't go on too uh, long here.